Uh, welcome everybody to this sixth webinar in this webinar series. I can't believe that I'm already in the sixth one, given that uh, the talk about doing a webinar feels like just yesterday. But welcome to this webinar. And we it actually means we've got three more webinars to go and the whole series will come to a close. So I am uh, Ernestine Rayonze, and I'm the Associate Dean for Law and Police Studies at York St. John University. So I research on shared parental leave and breastfeeding, and most recently I'm working on breastfeeding and its wider benefits much more. Um, I know some of you already know, but for those of you who don't know yet, uh, I recently launched a documentary on breastfeeding, which uh, some of the, the panelists you will be hearing from today contributed to that documentary, which was titled Breastfeeding Not on the Agenda. I had a lot of people asking me why that title, and I said, well, it's for the simple reason that when you look at the education agenda, you look at the family-friendly agenda, you look at the environmental agenda, breastfeeding is not mentioned or considered anywhere. So what that documentary was doing is highlighting the wider benefits of breastfeeding and also highlighting the challenges and uh, calling for a change or identifying and highlighting the need for a change. You would have had the links to the documentary in the event bright. Um, the, the documentary and all the recordings for these webinars, they sit on the same channel. So if you have the link, you will have the, li the link to all the webinars we've been having so far. And if you haven't, please just put um, uh, a question in the Q&A and I will give you the link. Um, so I am very pleased today to be welcoming a number of doctors. You know that doctors are not people that you easily get them because they are so busy. Uh, they're very busy saving lives and to have four doctors here, it's just amazing. So thank you all so much. We've got uh, Robin and I'm going, what I will do is I'll let them introduce themselves briefly uh, before they talk. So we've got Robin, Megan, um, Elaine, did I get that Eileen. right? Eileen, yeah. Eileen, thank you, sorry. I knew I was going to not get it right. Uh, I've got these three fantastic uh, doctors with me today to discuss breastfeeding as doctors. So the, their perspectives, their experiences, and what else is there for them to talk about? So I would like to, um, just because I really want to see Meg's uh, child, if I can uh, maybe say we open up with Meg. Meg, if you can just introduce yourself, please, and just Tell us a little bit about your breastfeeding journey and then where does your profession come into your experience, please? Uh, so my name's Megan Alexander. I'm a doctor working in anesthesia and intermittently in intensive care. Um, and I am mum to one currently with two on the way. Um, and so Thomas will be two in about two weeks time. Um, and he has been breastfed his entire life, but we did struggle to begin with, with breastfeeding. He didn't gain weight well, he was a very grumpy baby. Um, and we, it took until he was about eight weeks old for it to be recognized that um, he wasn't growing as expected um, and that something needed to change. Um, and one of the things that my husband and I still talk about is the fact that for those first eight weeks, every time he had a weight check, we were asked, are you happy with his weight gain? And I, you know, as an anaesthetist, normal child development and child weight gain is not a specialist area of mine. Um, and to be fair, my husband is a paediatrician, um, but he has very little to do with normal healthy babies. So he said, you know, I know what my expectation of a baby on a neonatal intensive care unit or, you know, a critically ill child, I know what I would expect for them, but actually I've never been taught what a normal healthy breastfed baby looks like. 
Um, so it took, it took a long while for us to recognize that actually he wasn't getting enough milk from me and he wasn't gaining enough weight. Um, and we then tried uh, what they call triple feeding. So I would breastfeed him. I would then pump after he'd been breastfed. Um, and then we'd have to top him up. And I never managed to really pump very much. So we ended up topping up with formula. And eventually I admitted that I just couldn't cope with a new, very grumpy baby and pumping and feeding and making formula and, and, all, and doing all of that. So we, we ended up combi feeding. Um, so he would be breastfed and then topped up with formula. And we did that until he was about six months old. And then as we introduced solids, we managed to wean him off the formula. Um, and so he was exclusively breastfed after that. And he now still loves his, loves his breastfeeding. Um, and uh, it's still a big part of our, a big part of our bond. And he's kind of considering waking up currently. Um, maybe not. <laughs> oh, he, he is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and we are so grateful that he could join us to, as well today. So thank you so much, Meg. I mean, it's it's just listening to uh, what you said there. It's interesting, and I, I can't help but just ask you this question. Um, given that you were a doctor, and your baby, you said it was until eight weeks before you realized that actually he was not uh, gaining weight the way he should or growing the way he should. As a doctor, um, how how was that for you? Because I, I suppose that uh, general generally when people hear the name doctor, in most cases they don't even think what is your specialist, but they think, well, you should know. And again, like you said, your your husband is a pediatri um, pediatrician. So how was that for you? Yeah, I mean, I think I think at the time both of us felt like we weren't the experts in this area and we were trying to rely on the midwife and then the health visitor because we recognized as healthcare professionals this should be their expert area um so we were trying very hard to not be the the doctor patient that kind of comes and says i know exactly what i want and what i need and we were kind of trying to just accept the support that we were given and, and and go with the flow i think i think in retrospect we probably knew that things weren't right and that things weren't going as well as as they should be but equally most of our knowledge was the same as other people's that had come kind of culturally to say you know babies should breastfeed every three hours and um, you know, you should be able to get them to go to sleep without the breast and um, we'd had no formal education on, on breastfeeding um, as medical students and um, I think the teaching on and learning on breastfeeding um, in paediatrics is very variable and often is just kind of absorbed from um other seniors um so again it becomes more of a cultural rather than science and evidence-based knowledge um so yeah i mean emotionally for both of us um it was more tied up around the fact that breastfeeding wasn't working um and neither of us were particularly focused at the time on the fact that we were doctors um and it, yeah, it, it, you know, I mean, you know what postpartum is like anyway. It's a very emotional and quite hormonal time. And then when you struggle with breastfeeding, you know, I'd kind of always said, you know, I, doesn't, I know it doesn't work for everybody and, and, and I would like to give it a go, but, I was, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be open minded. And then once I started it, I just had this overwhelming need to, for, for it to work and, and, and for it to be successful. Um, so I, I very honestly was completely devastated when the health visitor turned to my husband and said, you need to go out right now and, and buy some formula because he's not growing. Um, 
And it still makes me a little bit sad when I think about it, even though he's wonderful and beautiful. Um, it's it's still a part of our journey that 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 does make me a bit sad. Thank you so much for for sharing that. I can definitely tell that it's uh, not an easy subject, particularly uh, to talk about. Thank you for for that. Um, if I can just go to Eileen, did I get it right this time? Oh, thank you. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so again, if you can just introduce yourself first, please, and then just yeah. talk to us about your experiences or perspectives around around this, please. Um, thanks very much for listening to me, Firstly, I hope I've got something of, uh, of benefit to say. Um, I'm just after moving back from the UK where I did a clinical fellowship in fetal medicine in Liverpool. And I'm just about to start a research job in the Coombe Hospital. Um, so I'm kind of at the end of my junior doctor career and um, have breastfed three babies during my training. Um, my children are nine, five and two and a half. And I think cumulatively I've been breastfeeding for six years. Um, for me, I would I really empathize with Megan's story um, in the respect that I do think doctors have other health professionals assume that we know so much. And actually, in the eye of the storm as a parent, you don't really know very much at all, especially with your first baby. And that can be really destabilizing and difficult. And especially for doctors who quite like learning facts and knowing the answer. And often with breastfeeding, it's trial or error. Does this work? Does that work? You know, parenting is just a sort of uh, gooey journey that isn't right or wrong. And I think a lot of doctors, male and female, but in particular mothers, struggle with the um, greyness of it. I certainly did. Um, I come from a long line of breastfeeders. There's never been a gap in the sense that my mother breastfed. Again, I would have been a prolonged breastfeeder. My grandmother breastfed, which in Ireland in the 50s was pretty rare. Um, I was always going to breastfeed. There was never a question of formula. And I never was worried about the beginning. My mum was really supportive. She taught me how to breastfeed lying down very early on, which was a kind of a game changer. Um, and she was really encouraging. So the beginning for me was not so difficult. For me, and it continues to be a difficulty, the challenges have been breastfeeding older babies. And by older, in some people's eyes, that means a baby that's over three months. So mothers-in-law, colleagues, pediatricians. Why are you still breastfeeding? Your baby is six months old. Your baby is one year old. Um, so I think as doctors, actually, we carry quite a lot of hang-ups about extended breastfeeding. Um, and coming back, to, for me, the hardest part has been going back to work and figuring out how to navigate pumping, having a room, getting the baby in, somewhere to store it, getting the time, and then having to deal with people constantly saying, why are you still feeding him? He is two and a half. Um, so at the beginning, I had probably an easier ride, but now I still come up against it. And um, some of the you know, I work in maternity services and we have all baby friendly hospitals, but there are very few supports for breastfeeding mo working mothers and even fewer that are actually um, governed by regulation. Often it's just a kind of um, pro bono or sort of uh, 
the generosity of a particular ward has given you this room, but you can't be guaranteed that in the next hospital. Um, and certainly in an on-call setting or where you're doing emergency work, no one really wants to know that you need to go and pump. And if you suggest it and the baby's over one, I'm sure the other doctors will probably recognize that sort of shock, horror face. He's still breastfed. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, I think you've touched on something that I'll probably reserve it for now, uh, given that the World Breastfeeding Week only finished yesterday, but it hasn't really finished because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And you've touched on that subject about breastfeeding on return to work. So I'll probably leave that for now and then open that up more generally to, to all the panellists, uh, if that's all right. But like you say, I just have a quick question before I move on to Robin. Uh, you've talked about the fact that you come from a, a line or generations of, of breastfeeding. So, and I think you've made it clear that it made a difference to you in terms of uh, just thinking about it or even navigating that. So having people who are saying, why are you still breastfeeding? And that's a good point because we, even though we have the WHO recommendation, people's definitions of how long or how old the baby is still very much falls out in, out of sync with what the WHO has actually recommended. So with the support that you have from your family, how much did this comment from other people get to you or how did you navigate that? I mean, I'm a human, so... Even though I can put on a facade and say I'm absolutely fine, I it's it's jarring and it's tiring having to justify why I'm feeding a two and a half year old. My eldest was fed till he was four, and um, you know it was lovely. I didn't necessarily plan on feeding him till he was four, but it just sort of went that way, and um. Towards the end of it, I felt a little bit self-conscious breastfeeding him. I wouldn't breastfeed him in public as much, um, which is strange because, you know, I would be more confident with a smaller baby when I suppose you're just starting out. But I, you know, philosophically, I felt I have every right to do this. But you do feel those looks and whether they're there or not, or whether you're inferring that people are judging you um I did feel pressure to stop and my current baby you know I get really helpful comments all the time like are you still doing that hmm. um <laughs> you know what are you talking about but it just means it has you have to have a little level of aggro um which you know it's not not a thing that you want to have when you're mothering um you have to be battling and I think that's the thing with breastfeeding is that you have to sort of in the UK and Ireland anyway I think it's different in other European countries you sort of formula feeders have to justify themselves but so do breastfeeders and I know there is a lot of pushback that it's very valid to formula feed and that's fine but you know 60% of babies are still being formula fed it's not the other way around so I just don't really I don't buy that formula or fed as best thing. I think we still, and obviously you are doing such amazing work, but we do need to still work at this for a long time to come. I completely agree with you there. Thank you so much. And I'll move to Robin. Um, Robin, thank you for being here. If you can just introduce yourself, uh, please. And then you can... Talk about your personal experience and then you can talk about the breastfeeding support network for doctors. Um, just before Robin talks, I'm just saying to our uh, participants or the people we have in the audience, if you have questions, please just put them in the Q&A as we go along and we'll pick them up. Thank you. Robin, please. Hi. Can you hear me okay there? Great. Yeah. So um, 
I'm not I'm not currently in my own environment. I'm um in a flat in my parents' house, which is crowded with furniture that nobody wants. So and squeezed all our my family and my sister's family and my parents and our caravan are all squeezed in and the dog and the cat and there's a lot of people around and a lot of stuff. So I'm squeezed into a corner here and it's in Cork where it's very hot and it's rainy and damp as per standard. So um yeah, I'm not in a not in a comfortable place at all. And we're on a two-week holiday, which has involved four days camping in a two-birth caravan, five of us in uh in torrential rain. It's like it's like the Father Ted caravan episode. <laughs> we expected Graham Norton to walk in the door at any moment. So I'm dressed and I'm awake and I'm here and <laughs> hello. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Robin Powell, obviously. I am um, normally I'm an emergency medicine consultant. Um, in I work in North Wales. I live in on the Wirral near Liverpool and I'm from Cork. Um, I did all of my training in and around Liverpool, around Mersey, and I went to medical school in Liverpool as well. Um, and before that, I was working as cabin crew with British Airways for a few years. And before that, I worked in accounting. Um, so a varied history. And I came to medicine late age 29. And then I came to motherhood later, aged um, 35. So in my first year of being a doctor, um, which was hard work anyway. And like Eileen, I've come from a, a long line of, of breastfeeders. My mother is South African and um, was breastfeeding me in rural Ireland in the 70s. And she says literally nobody breastfed and nobody knew anything. And the person who gave her the most help was the nun at the nursing home where I was born because she didn't want me to go to hospital or she didn't want to go to hospital to be born. Apparently the fashion at that time was to have a general anaesthetic at the very last minute as the baby came out. And um, my mum felt that wasn't really as natural as she would like. So I was born in a nursing home with nuns and one of the nuns was the most helpful breastfeeding supporter. So my mum went on to, um, she went back to work as a teacher when I was eight months old and I she kind of stopped breastfeeding me then, but she had my sister three years after and she was breastfed till she was about four, again in the 70s. Um, and my mum joined La La Chile League and then became a La La Chile League leader. And I remember going off to conferences with her, of course, in the back of a car, Ford Fiesta, with the seats down in a duvet and no seatbelts and, you know, and... Um, <laughs> we always were given the nappy changing room to stay in <laughs> that night. So fond memories, but there was no question that I wasn't going to breastfeed <laughs> at all when I had my first. And, but I was in Liverpool away from my mother, away from my family with no, we had my in-laws, but they weren't really going to offer that kind of support. And they were a long line of formula feeders. Um, and no support from the hospital and absolutely nothing. And I just remember the first night I stayed in hospital, there was no reason for me to, but I did. And um, they, when she was awake all night, they took her away and they just gave her a formula, but they, nobody even asked me. Um, they just announced it when they brought her back. Um, nobody stayed with me and helped me to feed her or comfort her or whatever it was. Um, but anyway, we managed to breastfeed her till she was one. And I went back to work when she was four months old and she had a bit of a mix from then on, but mostly breast milk. And I did all the expressing at work in an orthopedic job, which was just, in fact, it was probably a great environment because nobody even wanted to think or hear about your breasts. Or if I really wanted to upset them, I'd speak about my pelvic floor and then they'd all just let me do what I wanted. So um, that that was probably easy enough, the expressing and everything. Then two years later, I had my second baby and I thought, right, this is it now. Breastfeeding is really going to go very, very well this time. This I, I know how to do it now. And we had a <clears throat> home birth 
the whole pregnancy went just brilliantly. The whole homework went, it was incredible. And I was on top of the world. And I was thinking, this is it now. This is everything. And this was worse than the first one. <laughs> um, with my second daughter, we know now she's 11. Um, well, we always do really, but that she's she's autistic. We, and um, I have ADHD and between the pair of us trying to get us together was like two magnets. Um, and eventually I went back to work when she was four months old and at six months old, she went on nursing strike and I didn't understand or know enough about it. And, and that was that. Um, <clears throat> and then fast forward, I needed a third baby to heal, heal my journey. And that's when I realized that um, that it was a, a, like a grief of you, you didn't get what you expected and you didn't get things to be the way you wanted them to be and the way you thought they'd be for whatever the reason and that it was okay to be upset about that and it was okay to grieve that and people saying well sure they'll be fine or I was formula fed and I was fine and it was nothing to do with that at all it was me me something that was important to me that I'd lost and nobody seemed to care at all it was like I always felt it was like I was trying to learn to play tennis and I couldn't quite get back and so everyone went well you'll be fine just play basketball instead and I felt like screaming, but I don't want to learn basketball. I want to learn tennis. Um, so I had my son, who's now six, and um, I had got it by this stage. So we had another home birth in a different house, and I took a residence in an armchair in the lounge with him and went between the armchair and the bed for three months. Um, and that was it. He was the fattest baby that anyone has ever seen. <laughs> his His chins and his neck held his head up but um and I was just so proud and his little little chunky thighs and he was wonderful um and it was wonderful and it was very very healing but I felt for many of my friends and people who don't get that kind of healing journey and what if I couldn't have had that as well was another thought but um it was when he was about three months old <clears throat> I went to one of the baby friendly conferences um, with some of the friends I'd made so online, so Louise from G GP Infant Feeding Network and um, Vicky Thomas and a couple of other people. And I was there, Keen and I went on our own and he was there in the sling the whole time and everyone was adoring him and all like the breastfeeding celebrities. So Jilly Weaver was, was, you know, admiring him and all, all the people, loads of photos with him and and. Uh, Louise from GPIFN made him his own little sweatshirt with GPIFN logo on it and he was this proper conference celebrity and he was there in the sling being breastfed for the whole thing <clears throat> and I remember just looking around the room and I was listening in, in a lecture theatre with maybe about I estimated about 3,000 people and listening to all these incredible incredible speakers and high quality evidence and research and all about breastfeeding and the benefits and think about how it doesn't work and how to you know why it won't work and how, how to support people and through it the whole message was well doctors need to change their attitude and doctors need to be taught this and doctors need to learn and doctors need to listen and looking around the room the room was full of people who were already on board with that message and I just thought this is the wrong message it's the or not the wrong message the message is right the method of delivery is right the audience is wrong it's the wrong audience this message has to get to the right audience there's very few doctors in the room here and I was just thinking about how <clears throat> how how can you get those messages because the evidence is there and the facts are there and I mean god they're in the lancet for goodness sake you know you can't get a lot better but still doctors on the whole don't take it seriously and I thought do you know what it is that doctors really need to hear things from other doctors um to feel confident and you know any everyone needs to hear things from their peers because you trust somebody who's telling you something that has your level of understanding or your your level of comfort with things and they understand the language that you talk um and so that's where the idea for breastfeeding for doctors came out of was to give doctors a safe space to talk in the language they talk in, but without feeling foolish and being able to support each other. 
And um, so that was in 2017. And now there's about, I, I think we're over 7,000 members now, but I'm not entirely sure um because it's all become massive and huge and overwhelming and we have a team of 50 and we need more and um yeah that's it with that um i'm now finding that i'm starting to be able to be able to move into bringing the, those breastfeeding basics in in at work so i've been working in my current job in north wales since november and before that i was doing a local consultant post in cork for about 12 months and um where I work now they're very happy for me to just get on with that and they need somebody sort of leading on peds and the there's a peds nurse consultant who is keen on very keen on breastfeeding as well and so between us and one of the pediatricians who is a member of our group um, we're putting on a pediatric study day and half of it um will be normal infant feeding and development and behavior um so that that's a start and i feel i'm finally a finally now being able to embed all the important breastfeeding basics and facts not myths you know evidence-based facts into actual medicine and in emergency medicine we're really well placed because we get a lot of doctors at the beginning of their careers who go into all kinds of specialties particularly gps who will do a bit in in emergency medicine and if we can target those people and just get those basics as this is what's normal we all believe this this is what's normal and that's my hope um for the future well one of them anyway there's, there's the other one which is taking over the world but through breastfeeding but that'll come <laughs> Well, Robin, thank you so much for sharing your experience as well as to um, Eileen and Meg for sharing your experiences. And it, it makes me, and I think you've touched on it, you've all touched on it uh, one way or the other. And, and it's this question around the expectation around you uh, being a doctor and being able or I wouldn't say unable, but facing challenges with things like this. So how do you navigate that expectation um, that, well, you're supposed to know, even though it's not your area, and yes, really, you don't know. How do you navigate those uh, challenges? Are you asking me or all of us? Sorry. I'm asking, sorry, I'm asking you, Robin. Sorry, I should have said. <laughs> sorry. Do you mind just repeating? How do you navigate? How do you navigate the expectation that uh, people are people think you should know, and then also actually in turn be able to support others and give them the right information? Because I think we have heard a lot, isn't it, when people are saying, "I did not get the right advice from doctors," or they are perpetrating myths. And it, I'm just linking that back to this expertise. So as far as the society, if I can put it that way, are concerned, uh, they just know that you are a doctor and your specialty sometimes really doesn't matter to them. They just want, uh, and if they were seeing you, they want uh, advice that will work for them. So how, how do you navigate this expectation linked with your personal experiences? How do you navigate that? Well. Number one, I don't I don't believe that um, all doctors can know, you know, all about breastfeeding. And I also don't believe that that they should. But what I do believe very strongly is that um, you, you can't make stuff up. Right. And this, this is what really, really annoys me. Well, I see this a lot at work, not just with breastfeeding, with other stuff. They don't know they make it up. I, I don't what is that that's not how any of us are trained um so what I strongly believe is that everyone should know where to signpost to either to refer on or to offer support to the person in front of them you know you can look at this website or you know that sort of a thing or they should know themselves where to look it up they're not sure about a drug you know where they can look it up or who to ask and there should be an expectation that all of the senior doctors would know those things like that should be part of a, a CCT, you know, a completion of training qualification, just that, you know, where to look. 
that you're not going to let people die because you haven't kept on prescribing them their antidepressant because you, you know, mistakenly believed it was dangerous or something, or you haven't cancelled them accurately enough. Um, so you, I think it's important and essential knowledge. And so we're um, at Breastfeeding for Doctors, we're working on, but we need more people and we need funding, but we're trying to work on um, building our website. So it's got more signposting, um, number one. And then um, number two, we're trying to work on some education packages, um, which we've been trying to do for a while. Um, because again, I think it's important that doctors have the option to be taught by doctors so they can hear that message from people again who speak the same language. Um, there's another thing that we we do. We have a a um, not quite sure what to call it. It's not really a service. Um, we have a thing where. <laughs> If you go somewhere and you get incorrect information, you can email us and tell us and we will send out a letter to the clinic or the surgery or the whatever. Um, and it's no blame. We don't name anyone. Um, we just say we've heard that this information was given out. It's not correct. We give them the correct information, complete with the evidence and the references and the links. The whole thing is fully referenced and the letter says why why it's important and that the GMC the, and the Irish Medical Council, you know, require you to behave in a professional manner and to provide patients with up-to-date, accurate information and, and shared decision-making as well. And that you've got to respect patients and you've got to respect autonomy. So we put all that in, it's all referenced and we've sent a few of them out. Now, we've had more requests than we've been able to send out because we're so strapped for time and for people to do it. Um, but the intention is there and we'd like to get more of those sent out so we can contact the places after and see how they were received as well but that's one thing we've decided to try and do um and this is just a is very slightly related aside but eileen you were saying you know you were talking about people saying are you still doing that or why are you still feeding him he's he's three or four or whatever and my friend recently said to me because the other one is sleep why why is he sleeping through the night yet um, and my friend said to me recently that you just uh, say to them, why do you ask? And that's it. <laughs> that's very good. <laughs> I think yeah. it's, I think you can apply that answer to so many things <laughs> and then just not get angry. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Just before I forget, Robin, uh, in terms of that resources you're talking about, which people can uh, contact you if they've had a, of, or if they've been misinformed is it something that you're probably happy to share with our audience which you can send it to me and we'll send it to the people who are registered for this uh webinar is that something you're happy to do yeah we don't we only send it on request because we keep records okay. and we also don't want people to do something in our name that isn't like there a lot of research has gone into how, or a lot of work has gone into how we've written and worded the letter. Right. Um, but if, if you go on our website, I'm pretty sure we either have or are, will imminently have, but I think we have a form that you can fill in um, to get the to get the letter. I'll have a look when you're talking in a second and I'll just see what it looks like and I can tell you then. OK, thank you so much, Robin. Thank you. Um, I'm coming back to. Ireland and, and Meg, any one of you can answer this, uh, please. And we've got one question in the chat. I'll come to that in a minute, but I've got one question. Um, so we've heard a, a lot from, from different mothers about uh, lack of support. So they call lack of support. It's very general. Okay, so lack of support. And I wondered whether in your personal experience, did you, how would you, say your the support you got from health problems so now that's how we generalize health professionals what how much support did you get um when you had your uh, babies when you were going through the breastfeeding experiences uh, do you think the support could have been better how what what would you say about the support you got um either meg or or alan any one of you please maybe meg because i had an okay beginning journey it was later i had issues 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I think I think the support that we got early on um, initially was quite was quite lacking. Um, we were we had the kind of standard, you know, midwife um, led care initially and, and then health visitor um, afterwards. Um, and at no point did any of them actually watch my son feed or even offer to watch my son feed. Um, in, even when we had weeks where he gained 40 grams in the space of a week. Um, and I think, I think probably the support was there if we knew to ask for it and we knew specifically what we were looking for. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that, that necessarily the support that we got um, was, was poor in, in totality because they, you know, they, they, they came and they did their job and they weighed the baby and they did, did all the things that, that um, they were expected to do. Um, once his feeding issues were identified, we were referred to the local infant feeding team and then we had had very good support from a, from the NHS lactation consultant um, and she was the one that then guided us through our feeding journey after that and how to navigate combi feeding without um, dropping my supply and ending up fully formula feeding. Um, but I, I think... I think it was just knowledge more than anything. And I think even health visitors and midwives have such variable training on breastfeeding. Um, even when you think they're the ones that are there right in the heart of it and supporting families through this, you know, some of them have had additional training and some of them have done the kind of two day UNICEF baby friendly initiative training um, and so, so you know, they 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 again develop a kind of cultural knowledge that they've learned from their mentors. Um, so you can't you can't always guarantee the that the support or the the knowledge is is has been gained. Um, and I think the lack of knowledge on our side as well, and the kind of expectation that that we had half an idea of what we were doing. Um, tied in with a lot of, of our journey and that with the knowledge that I now have and in retrospect I think things had the potential to go very differently for us. Um, I'm conscious that I've kind of waffled a little and wandered around there so I hope, I hope my point came through. <laughs> yeah absolutely Meg thank you so much. I think you're quite right the experiences are quite varied um, and that's why you hear mothers that talk about, some people talk about having a fantastic support and others are talking about having very little or no support. So yeah. you're quite right there. Thank you. Um, there is a question in the q and I'm just going to read the question and any one of you panelists uh, can answer, please. Um, it says, thank you all for sharing your stories and experiences. It's appreciated. In my London borough, we see a lot of families going to A&E for feeding issues with infants. What can we do in public health to support A&E staff, doctors and GPs to support nursing parents better? Should public health be providing training? And if so, what should this be? Anyone of you want to answer that question or try answering that question? That is a very big question to answer, but I just want to say that I would touch on sort of echoes a bit what Meg was saying about um, the variable experience. There's very little in my own experience that uh, can um, trump lived experience of breastfeeding. So breastfeeding buddies and um, so, for example, some of my colleagues are breastfeeding now when they net, they didn't breastfeed their other children because they would have been around me and I would have said, well, it's really easy. Just give it a go and try it. Um, it's not really easy. Obviously, I was kidding, but um, it's the sort of having that community knowledge and the experience of my mother knew these little tricks, you know, her grandmother knew these little tricks and actually 
it's a big societal issue that we no longer have the village to advise us on what to do and a lot of families for example I'm guessing in London are going to be relatively dispersed and away from their social support network so I'm not sure if you can engage with Bambi's or engage with local breastfeeding support groups who can support staff because you can send someone to a breastfeeding training day but if you've breastfed a baby and navigated a tricky latch or sore nipples or oversupply or wind or whatever there's nothing really like that lived experience to give you the advice giver the confidence to advise somebody else and I think it's you know if you've got a 22 year old a knee doctor who's you know the idea of breastfeeding is you know long in the future for them I'm not sure how, I mean Robin can contradict me here I'm not sure um how much you can teach them for me it's more powerful to have a woman who's breastfed ad advising me or giving me tips and I would have used um Robin's group uh, extensively during my breastfeeding journey and um, that sort of collective hive um, of experience you know maybe there has to be a, a breastfeeding for the community on Facebook for the public potentially but I, I think the village is important in helping people navigate breastfeeding problems thank you very much uh, Robin I think you want to come in yeah, um, I absolutely agree there with, with Eileen. The The problem is, the problem that we've got is, is that in society, our normal understanding and expectations of infant feeding and behaviour were obliterated. And what we have to do is normalise them back in, basically. That's it. Um, and all of the ideas are good. Any of the ideas will contribute, but we need all of the things together. Um, and the very first thing to do, I think, is just to open the conversation. So <clears throat> having those communities, whatever the community is, like Eileen's saying, you know, um, we've got one for doctors. We want one for allied health professionals. We've tried it, but we need people to run it. Um, and then you could have one. I mean, there's no end. You could have breastfeeding for accountants. You could have breastfeeding for, I don't know, actuaries and engineers and whatever you want, you know. Um, but any of those groups are important because they keep the conversation open and they keep people talking. As long as there's somebody there to make sure, you know, they're not perpetuating the myths again or it's not a formula company getting their message across. But it's normalizing it and making those conversations normal. and people saying to you what you're doing is hard it it is it just is hard but this is normal you're not doing anything wrong that's okay or when it's not normal you know we need to get that fixed um and i agree again that how much can you teach a 22 year old who this is way way far away from what they're thinking a doctor um however the only thing I will say is I've always encouraged and I know they all think I'm absolutely mental, but the juniors, if there's a breastfeeding mother, I'll grab one of the poor SHOs and I'll bring them in. I'll go, I'll ask the mother, you know, could they come in and have a look at the baby feeding? And they always say yes. And I bring them up and I say, look, this is the baby feeding. This is what it's meant to look like. This is what you're looking for. Talk to the mother, spend some time. And they all think I'm mad, but a lot of them now I've noticed 10 years on are in our in our group they've, they're now breastfeeding their own babies and they've come back and they've said I remember when you did that and like clearly they thought I was mad at the time but somebody had to be the first mad person to open that conversation and get them feeling this is something they can talk about and they can ask about um and the second thing that I'm I wanted to make reference to is that we really need to look after our staff better because if we start with our staff they're such a valuable resource an a and &E nurse or an A&E doctor who has breastfed themselves is, is powerful, really powerful. And I see them advocating, the nurses advocating for patients daily, trying to keep breastfed babies with their mothers when the mothers are admitted. And they will go to great lengths to do it. These are such valuable resources that um, trusts and everyone really need to invest in a bit more. So if you're from a public health point of view, because that's what the question was, if you're asking what can we do, number one, 
from a public health point of view, if you can come up with a campaign where we can have more conversations through all, well, through your question was about A&E, but it'll work in any, in orthopedics or wherever. We just need to make it not a taboo subject that we can talk about it and it's okay. So that would be one thing, opening the conversation. The second thing would be look, making sure staff get looked after properly because returning to work experience is so varied, even from department to department and even from week to week. <laughs> Um, but if we can get that right, and if we can get our breastfeeding doctors and nurses returning to work and feeling that this is so important and they are so valued and they are helping to add to the public health promotion, if they feel like that, that will spread. So I'd say those are the two most important things for public health. We have a couple of public health doctors on our team um, and they're both excellent. And um, I'm sure they'd have a lot more to say than that. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. I think you touch again, um, Eileen did, is it Eileen or Meg? Oh, well, sorry, I've forgotten now. Uh, touch on this return to work aspect as well. And I think uh, it's it came to me as a surprise, if I have to be uh, very honest, that the our doctors or the NHS as a whole, uh, which we would um, imagine that there will be the role model for all other employers in terms of supporting breastfeeding mothers returning to work, um, which unfortunately research seemed to show the contrary in terms of how doctors are supported. So what, what can we do? I mean, you had a, your doctors or the NHS are, are the people that know the benefits of all breastfeeding and all these things. So, but actually the support is really not there for uh, doctors or, or any health professional returning to work. So what can we do? What can be done to, to support um, health professionals who are returning to work and breastfeeding? It's got to be legislation. I hate to say it, but you need a you need a stick in this circumstance. <laughs> You've got to make it a requirement to have a policy, a space, a fridge, time mm. it's got to be enshrined in, in regulations because it, I've an experience both in the UK and in Ireland and in the largest teaching hospital in Ireland when I returned to work with a seven month old nowhere to pump nowhere to store this is a massive hospital with hundreds of mothers breastfeeding presumably and no policy the exact same thing in Liverpool Women's Hospital. No breastfeeding policy for workers. No space. I mean, I rest my case on that one. Has to come from the legislature, I think. I don't know, do you girls agree? But I do, um, but I also think there's a lot of culture change that has to happen. If you think... If you think about how doctors are treated at work, and I know like we know this, but you know, other people are not going to know it. But doctors are, are not treated very well at work and our working conditions are not good at all. Like I don't have enough, well, I have an office. I'm a consultant. I share an office with two other consultants. The office is about maybe two meters by one and a half. There's three desks in there and they want to put someone else in there. There's no windows and there's no ventilation and you can't control the lighting. Mm -hmm. um, we all get migraines, our skin is bad. It, I have constant colds and viruses. So that, that's just one example. And yet yeah, people think that you're a consultant, you have your own office. No, we have to have meetings in there, all of us at the same time with different people. <clears throat> um, and so putting that into context, the difficulties of finding room for, for a doctor to breastfeed in is really not the top of anybody's priority list. You know, they don't, they think doctors should just turn up to work and we don't have lockers to keep our stuff in on the whole. We don't tend to have break rooms. Um, and even like European Working Time Directive laws won't always be adhered to. HR policies and occupational health policy policies will vary from trust to trust and from area to area and the people will get around what they can often not through malice just through you know ignorance maybe or laziness or I don't know 
sometimes. But until we change that narrative and until we value ourselves more and our health and well-being more and our future health and well-being more, these things aren't going to change. And yeah, yes, legislature, which I can't say, would be <laughs> really, really important. Me neither. <laughs> but it will need the people to drive that and to not be trying to get around it. So to, to the people who will drive that, because doctors traditionally, you know, have higher suicide rates than the general population and are have higher rates of things like uh, divorce and alcoholism, substance misuse. Because and I believe because we because we are not valued and we don't value our own well being and then that is not valued and supported and then we're turning to those avenues. Wouldn't it be lovely if we were valued and supported to turn to things that would improve our future health and the health of a nation, like breastfeeding? And there everybody's into um, doing boot camps at work now. That came out of COVID. The well being funding all goes into everybody. Oh yes. Work. Not breastfeeding, but anyway. Um, and I just think it would be it would be fantastic. It's so powerful if you have a staff member sitting in scrubs or something, which I've done, breastfeeding their baby in the cafe or whatever, in the public area. It not only says this hospital welcomes breastfeeding, it says we encourage it. We support our staff to go and feed in public and people can see you and Doctors are so important, you know, as that to, to provide that role modeling, that public trust, to be publicly seen to do that goes further than any campaign, any poster campaign, I think. Um, so what can we do to support doctors and nurses? I think legislature, but also working on lobbying bodies to change the culture to change how they value doctors and doctors working conditions and this is what um dare i say it, but the do the doctor strike in the bma campaign has been about that as a baseline and they're not specifically talking about breastfeeding i feel they should and we did try to make a, a bit of a point of some of that um but it's all part of it it all comes into a culture change that's needed so lobbying like the gmc and the unions and the government as well mm. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, I think all what you said, I couldn't agree more. And it just nicely sums up all of this and, and really ends it for us quite nicely. I think the take home point is, come on, doctors are humans with their own challenges as well. We need those support structures in place. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you to our fantastic audience. Um, thank to you. Len, to Meg, thank you so much for being here with us and, and sharing your experiences quite openly. Really appreciate that. And we hope that someday this, this, this story, the narratives will change and the fantastic work that, uh, Robin, you're doing with your team, you know, will go on a long way. Um, even if it changes just one person's story, that's still so much. So thank you all so much for being here with us. And um, yeah, if you're able to join us next week for the next webinar, which is focusing more on Northern Ireland, because Northern Ireland uh, has the lowest breastfeeding rate in the UK, even though the UK has the lowest breastfeeding rate, uh, one of the lowest breastfeeding rates in the world. Um, please do if you can. But thank you all so much for being here with us and have a good day. <laughs>